HPRP Beyond the Basics. I'm Susan Ziff from HUD, and I'm participating on the webinar today um, as a presenter. I am the project manager and team lead for the HPRP team here at HUD headquarters. Presenters during this webinar include Tom Albanese, who's one of our national technical assistance providers. Christy Greenwald, another national TA provider, will be fielding question, questions and contributing the, to the conversation as we move through the presentation. Teresa Silla will also be taking your questions. Many of you have recently participated on other webinars that we've held that are addressing specific program areas. This series of webinars was developed to respond to communities who have emphasized the need for more training and updated information about HPRP. Now, whereas past webinars have focused on clarifying and reiterating the requirements of HPRP, we've heard some feedback from all of you that you wanted to get into some of the challenges and complexities of implementing this program. So we developed this webinar in a slightly different style to try to address some of this feedback. So before we start, um, let's discuss some specific information relating to today's webinar. Today's webinar is designed to provide grantees and subgrantees with more in-depth exploration of key issues and hot topics as you all, the grantees and subgrantees, delve into the implementation of HPRP. Today we're going to talk about successful targeting of HPRP resources, effective service design and delivery, common issues that have been identified during recent HUD monitoring visits, and fraud prevention. We're going to be discussing each of these issues as well as some others, and we're going to identify some key things for you to think about. We're also going to be talking about, through some case scenarios to help explore these issues a little more. Now, I do want to mention up front, oops, sorry about that. Uh, I do want to mention up front that the question of how to target is probably the number one challenge that grantees and providers are having. So every time I've gone out and spoken with grantees, they ask me for tips about how do you know whether someone is appropriate for HPRP assistance? How do you know if they're going to become homeless without HPRP? And it, it is really difficult to balance those questions, especially when there's someone sitting in front of you or a family that needs housing now. So I'm sorry to say that I don't have a magic answer to those questions, except to say that it's something that everyone is, is challenged by, and there is no easy solution. So today we're going to talk about um, how do you handle this. And we're also going to talk about the fact that there is a reliance in this program on the professional judgment of the case manager and on documenting the decisions that are made. Again, the case scenarios we talk about hopefully will help you think about the issues and provide you with some best practices. Now, at certain points during today's webinar, we're going to pause to take questions and comments from webinar participants and try to answer some of your questions live. Now, we're not going to be developing new policies, but we did want to take this time to help you know, help you think through the issues that you're seeing in your communities and apply the existing policy to the scenarios. Today, um, today's call is actually, it, it might go over the hour and a half that we have, that we've kept all the other webinars to. Last week when we did this, it went to an hour and 45 minutes. So um, we'll, we'll try to keep it to an hour and a half if we can. Now, as an attendee of this webinar, your microphone is automatically muted. I will let you know that, again, in past webinars, we've had some technological issues, and we are working with the, the, web, um, the webinar provider. So uh, it actually caused some people not to be muted when they, we thought that they were. So we apologize if that happens. Please do make sure that you're muted, that your computer or telephone is on mute, um, and we'll try to avoid that again. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on hudhre.info to allow all of you to view the information. And again, um, on past webinars, we also have learned that some participants have difficulty hearing the presentation when they're listening over their computer. So if that happens, try dialing into the phone number, because that seems to be a me better method for hearing the audio. If you have a question or if you do need clarification on a current or previous slide, go to the questions pane that's located on the toolbar to the right of your screen. Again, as I mentioned, we're going to be taking live questions. So 
submit your questions via that method. Um, and we'll get to that point when we announce that we're going to be taking questions. So remember, we actually have over 300 people on this call today. So we are not going to be able to get to every question. Um, but if, you don't, if we don't get your question, please submit it to the virtual help desk at the web link that's on your screen. And again, today's slides are already posted on the HRE. Um, we'll be updating them if, with a couple of little changes. And we did also mention in advance that we were going to send out some um, additional guidance materials, but the, we've incorporated those into the slides. Lastly, uh, following the webinar today, you are going to receive a survey to provide us with feedback, which we do read and take seriously. It will be emailed directly to you. So, and with that, I will pass the webinar on to Tom Albany. Great. Thanks, Susan. Um, for this part of the uh, webinar, we're going to talk some about eligibility and targeting. And uh, the first thing we'd like to do is just to very quickly uh, review uh, the eligibility requirements. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I think uh, folks are familiar, uh, for HBRP, uh, in order to be eligible, uh, everyone must be uh, initially assessed uh, for eligibility and to determine the appropriate type of assistance. Um, income must be assessed, and at a minimum, folks must be uh, at or below 50% of very median income. And then housing status, uh, which essentially relates to whether or not a person is uh, presently uh, homeless or is at imminent risk of homelessness, and if they uh, would lack the financial resources and support networks uh, to obtain remain in housing um, and have uh, no subsequent uh, housing options. Um, I just want to point out that the assessment of other financial resources, support networks, and subsequent housing options is essentially the but-for rule. And we'll talk more about this later this morning, but uh, it's important to keep in mind that in trying to determine whether or not an applicant uh, will be homeless but for uh, HBRP assistance, uh, that but for rule is essentially encapsulated in uh, the questions about whether or not an applicant has other financial resources, support networks, or subsequent housing options. And that assessment determines whether or not someone meets the but for criteria. Um, I will emphasize that uh, the number one monitoring finding in HUD homeless programs is related to the eligibility of clients. Uh, this is a primary focus when HUD comes out to monitor. And so it's a, it's a critical question, not just to ensure that we're serving the right folks uh, with HBRP, but also to make sure we're uh, crossing our T's and dotting our I's. Next slide, please. Um, so when we talk about eligibility, one thing that we want to be clear about is the difference between eligibility criteria and targeting. Um, they're related, obviously, but they're not one and the same. How to target HBRP is obviously, as Susan pointed out, one of the biggest questions that communities implementing HBRP have had. Um, first of all, uh, as, as I quickly reviewed there, we, we all are familiar with the basic eligibility criteria for HBRP. That's spelled out in the notice. There's further guidance that's been published around that. Um, eligibility is determined in the initial uh, assessment. And it's based on whether or not the uh, household that uh, uh, meets the income criteria as well as the housing status criteria. All households have to meet these criteria. Targeting, however, is trickier, and, and it can be trickier uh, anyway. And it, it's typically based on factors beyond basic eligibility that allow grantees and subgrantees to identify and serve persons with specific characteristics or risk factors. The decisions that a community makes around targeting will impact decisions around the type, level, and duration of assistance a program offers. So if you structure a program to target only persons who not only meet the HBRP criteria but have additional uh, risk factors or barriers or characteristics, that in turn will influence how uh, the program is designed and types, uh, level, and duration of assistance that's provided. At the same time, uh, we have to remember that when we design our programs, when you de determine that, uh, uh, you know, uh, let's say, for example, uh, assistance, uh, rental assistance under HBRP in a 
uh, within uh, your community is going to be limited to, let's say, only six months instead of the maximum 18 months allowed. Uh, if you cap rental assistance at a six-month duration, that in turn influences who, sh who should be targeted uh, by the program. So, for example, some uh, applicant who might need, um, uh, in terms of uh, based on the assessment, uh, might uh, appear to, to need upwards to 12 months of rental assistance in order to address their barriers, may not be a suitable uh, candidate uh, for the program, but the program limits assistance to six months. So, in essence, um, targeting decisions impact program design and program design impacts targeting. And we, we should be uh, mindful of this. Um, targeting may involve setting more stringent eligibility criteria than required by HUD, as I mentioned, in order to serve folks determined to be more at risk of homelessness. A grantee may decide, for example, to limit eligibility to households at or below 30% of area median income or serve only those households who will lose housing in the next seven days uh, or even to serve how households to meet uh, basic uh, criteria but then decide to provide more intensive and more expensive assistance uh, possibly to households who have greater needs. So targeting criteria can be used either as, as part of the initial screening or subsequent to eligibility determination in order to determine uh, the type and level of services. Um, some grantees have set lower income targets and in some cases combine lower income eligibility thresholds with additional risk, risk factors as a way to better target households who are at greater risk of homelessness. Um, targeting may also involve identifying persons who are best served by the program based on the program design and the intended target population. So for example, if a grantee makes a policy decision based on resources or population uh, and limits HPRP to a maximum of three months, then this is a targeting criteria, as I mentioned. Um, I want to emphasize again that HPRP is intended to, uh, under the uh, prevention component, is intended to target households who are most at risk of becoming literally homeless. However, there's not a lot of research that tells us what predictive factors we should be assessing that will tell us who will, in the future, become homeless, uh, which is why HUD has structured the HPRP criteria, uh, as far as the but-for rule, uh, around um, actual present conditions in terms of financial resources, support networks, and whether or not there are other viable, available housing options. Uh, those are very concrete things that can be assessed uh, and don't rely on uh, characteristics or other things that uh, don't lend themselves well to predicting who will become homeless without assistance. Next slide, please. So who should be served with HPRP homelessness prevention assistance? Uh, ultimately, for homelessness prevention, uh, this is intended, as I mentioned, to serve households who will imminently lose housing but for uh, the assistance and become literally homeless, uh, meaning these are households who, uh, in the absence of HPRP, uh, will very soon be calling up and asking for emergency shelter or otherwise uh, be on the street. And that's the way to think about it. These are folks who are on the verge of falling into our homeless systems, and we're trying to prevent that. Um, so in essence, greatest risk means that uh, a household has exhausted all their uh, reasonable options and is on the verge of needing shelter without um, uh, some intervention by HPRP. Uh, a challenge for many grantees is understanding and identifying households who are at greatest risk, uh, which is what we'll talk more about today in some uh, case scenarios. Uh, but I do want to emphasize, the farther one gets from the point of needing emergency shelter, the more difficult it is to predict who will ultimately need it. Um, persons experiencing a housing crisis typically will exhaust most, if not all, of their resources and all reasonable housing options before seeking emergency shelter. In most communities, uh, if you look at data, you'll see that uh, the majority of folks coming into shelter are coming from doubled up situations, indicating that uh, truly uh, folks are really trying to uh, exhaust every option before 
turning to uh, shelter. However, we also know that many who do reach out for shelter um, at the same time may still be able to keep their current housing or relocate to other permanent housing with assistance from HPRP if, that, if um, uh, they meet eligibility. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk about a uh, case example. Um, and I'll just read this uh, very briefly. Anna and her daughter have been living with Anna's sister for the past two months. Anna works part-time waitressing and has no other source of income. Um, her sister can no longer house her and said she must leave uh, within the week. Anna has $600 in savings and has no other support networks, resources, or housing options except possibly an aunt. So what does an HBRP program need to document in the case file related to eligibility? Let's just cover our bases here uh, for a moment and talk about sort of basic eligibility. Um, grantees and subgrantees are responsible for uh, assuring that uh, Anna meets the uh, income requirements uh, and uh, obviously uh, for that, uh, copies of uh, her most recent uh, pay stubs uh, would be the first order um, uh, documentation that that uh, program should seek out or a written verification from the employer. Basically, this is written third-party documentation. If written third-party documentation cannot be obtained and due diligence is, is used to try to obtain that, then oral verification or documentation via uh, a phone call by the caseworker uh, to the employer uh, is acceptable. If oral third-party verification can't be obtained, uh, then uh, self-declaration of income can be used. But again, you can only use the sort of lowest standard of uh, verifying income, which is self-declaration, if uh, written third-party and then oral third-party is first attempted to be att obtained. For housing status, um, a letter from Anna's sister uh, would be the preferred uh, documentation uh, for the file. Uh, that would constitute written third-party documentation. If, however, Anna's sister is uh, unwilling to uh, put something in writing or uh, simply uh, time doesn't uh, allow for that because of the urgency of the situation, in other words, it's not reasonable uh, to accept uh, or to expect um, uh, a written letter from the sister, then an oral verification via a phone call uh, from the caseworker to Anna's sister would be the next um, a type of documentation that should be sought. Um, if oral third-party verification can't be obtained, then lastly, a program may use self-declaration by the applicant. In this case, Anna uh, just self-declaring her housing status and uh, signing a statement to that effect uh, would be uh, acceptable. Uh, in, in cases where a lower standard of documentation is used, something other than written third-party documentation, um, a caseworker or HPRP staff member has to document in the case file uh, by, uh, uh, in the case notes or on the assessment summary or somewhere that's easily found, uh, attempts that, that have been made, in other words, the due diligence that was uh, used to try to attain uh, a higher standard of documentation and why a lower standard was used. Um, in addition, uh, a copy of Anna's sister, sister's lease showing that she is the leaseholder would be needed. This is important because it verifies that Anna's sister is the rightful tenant and has the authority to make decisions regarding the unit. Um, some grantees have reported difficulties obtaining a copy of the relative's or friend's lease, particularly in cases where the guest is staying in violation of the lease. Uh, attempts to obtain the lease must still be made and documented. In other words, um, HBRP grantees and subgrantees are still responsible for, for uh, trying to obtain a copy of, uh, in this example, Anna's sister's lease. If one cannot be obtained, however, then the applicant would need to certify that their relative or friend is, in fact, um, the rightful uh, lease holder. Um, in this case, however, uh, if self-declaration is used, um, uh, 
it is uh, preferable to uh, not only get a self-declaration from uh, Anna, but to also uh, get that notified because now Anna is in fact sort of attesting to um, you know uh, something that's not um, directly sort of germane to her, but it's her sister's sort of um, um, her sister's position as the leaseholder. So uh, HUD would prefer that such statements are notarized if at all possible. Ultimately, uh, when obtaining documentation for eligibility, uh, grantees and subgrantees should uh, be mindful of what's reasonable to attain and uh, apply due diligence in accord with that. There may be instances due to the urgency of the situation, um, due to the unavailability of uh, third-party uh, documentation where lower standards um, must be used. Um, or where it doesn't make sense, or the crisis uh, could, couldn't be averted uh, if uh, you had to wait uh, an inordinate amount of time, let's say, for documentation from an employer. Uh, in those cases, in those types of situations, lower standards are acceptable, but again, that should be clearly documented in the case file. So if a grantee comes in to monitor a subgrantee, or if HUD were to come in and monitor uh, or if just simply for supervisory uh, review, uh, uh, if someone else is looking at the case file, they can easily understand um, why the documentation um, that's in the file, uh, why, why that, that standard was used uh, versus a higher standard of documentation. Um, the related question here is whether or not Anna will be homeless then but for HPRP. And the answer is it depends. Uh, it depends firstly on whether or not uh, her aunt is able to house her, whether or not that's another housing option uh, for Anna. If Anna can stay with her aunt, um, then uh, a program should um, uh, direct her uh, to do that if it seems like her aunt can put her up for an indefinite amount of time while Anna addresses her housing issue. In that situation, then Anna would not meet the but-for rule. However, if Anna can't stay with her aunt, or if her aunt is only able to house her for a very short period of time, and it's not reasonable to expect that during her stay, Anna will resolve her housing crisis and not require emergency shelter, then HPRP staff should document this via the assessment and clearly indicate that Anna does not have other support networks or appropriate subsequent housing options. So in essence, if Anna's aunt isn't able to uh, house her uh, in a time frame that allows Anna to uh, resolve her housing crisis and not fall into the shelter system or need shelter, then in fact that's not a reasonable subsequent housing option. And that just needs to be clearly documented in the case file. Um, at the same time, Anna, as it's indicated in the scenario, has $600. So the question uh, uh, comes up as to whether or not uh, that means Anna doesn't meet the but-for test. Uh, ultimately, this depends on what the grantee's treatment of asset policy states. Uh, HUD has directed every grantee to come up with a treatment of asset policy uh, to identify um, what assets uh, an applicant would have to spend down before they might be eligible for HBRP assistance. Uh, so in this example, uh, let's say the grantee's treatment of asset policy states that applicants can have no more than $500 in savings or checking uh, before qualifying for HBRP assistance. Um, we know, uh, let's say in this example, that $600 is not sufficient by itself to obtain housing. However, because the grantee's treatment of asset policy states that Anna can't have more than $500 in the bank, uh, Anna will have to contribute at least $100 of her uh, uh, resources in savings in order to qualify for HPRP assistance in this example. Uh, remember, to determine eligibility related to the but-for requirement, HPRP staff must explore with an applicant all of their housing options, financial resources, and support networks, and clearly document this in the case file. 
Um, if an applicant does not have other housing options, resources, or support networks to obtain or maintain housing, this should be indicated in the assessment or other case file documentation. For other resources, other support networks, other housing options, third-party documentation is not required. It is simply based on the assessment, um, and that needs to be clearly indicated um, in the case file, uh, the particular uh, situation uh, that an applicant is in uh, relative to those, um, those resources and options. Next slide, please. Um, so let's talk uh, briefly about uh, some tips around how to uh, uh, address the issue of the but-for um, provision. Um, when HUD monitors, uh, they need to see evidence in the case file, uh, as I mentioned, that the but-for um, uh, test has been met, that there's no other resources, uh, support networks, or housing options. Um, Examples of case file documentation, I mentioned the, the uh, case file uh, notes or uh, an assessment tool. Uh, they may also include a statement um, in the case notes uh, such uh, that uh, there is no family in the area or the household has applied at several churches and been refused. Uh, those types of statements are uh, uh, you know, clear indications that no other resources or support networks are available and that those issues have been explored with uh, the applicant. Ultimately, um, the uh, objective is to create a clear paper trail in the case file. So as I mentioned, if someone, a third party, uh, say HUD or the grantee were to come and monitor, they could clearly see the thought process, the questions, and the uh, disposition and why that disposition um, and final eligibility, how, how, what that was based on. Um, ultimately, decisions need to be defensible and reasonable. What reasonable is, is of course subjective, however. Um, so when considering whether or not an applicant has other housing options, resources, or support networks, it's important to think about whether such options and resources are reasonable for the applicant to access and use uh, in a manner and time frame that resolves their housing crisis. So let's talk about uh, another example briefly. While an applicant uh, with three children may have an elderly uh, relative to stay with uh, as another housing option, if that relative is in a one-bedroom assisted living unit and isn't permitted to have guests stay longer than one week, then that would not be uh, in many cases, uh, a reasonable, appropriate housing option. And that just would need to be clearly indicated in the file that that was explored with the applicant. It was determined that that, in fact, isn't a reasonable housing option, um, that the you know, uh, household is still at imminent risk uh, of becoming homeless because as soon as that's exhausted, they're going to go to shelter. Uh, that sort of statement is, it needs to be uh, clearly sort of indicated in the file. Uh, another example relates to other community resources or assistance. So if an applicant is potentially eligible for financial assistance for rent or utilities from another funding source, but the time frame to apply for and receive such assistance isn't reasonable given the immediacy of the need. In other words, assistance from the other source can't be obtained in time to meet the need uh, before homelessness, homelessness uh, would occur then it's reasonable to conclude that that resource is not, in fact, available to resolve the crisis and prevent homelessness. Remember, HPRP staff uh, should clearly indicate this and document this in the assessment or case notes or other case file documentation. Uh, it does not require that, um, uh, that uh, in this uh, particular example, that that other source of potential um, uh, assistance uh, provide documentation that they can't provide assistance in a timely fashion or whatever the case may be. Uh, that just needs, it's a caseworker uh, determination based on the individual situation. Uh, ultimately, um, design, applying the but-for rule is really an art and it requires constant review and refinement. And so staff training on this is critical, but also staff supervision and regular uh, 
uh, review of cases and dispositions and eligibility determinations. And I would say specifically um, a periodic review of service denials uh, along with um, uh, a review of uh, applicants who were approved for assistance uh, should be conducted in order to uh, fine-tune the eligibility uh, process. Next slide, please. So at, at this point, uh, we're going to open it up uh, to some questions. Christy has been monitoring uh, questions that have come in, and I'm going to um, pass it off to her for a moment. Great. Thanks, Tom. Well, we've received a lot of good questions. We're trying to answer some of them as we go, but there are a few that I uh, want to open up just for discussion. So the first question, uh, Tom, is, is related to documentation, which you spent some time talking about. And the question is, is an eviction notice the only way to qualify a family for homelessness prevention when there are other risk factors involved? For example, what if a participant has lost their job and has no family or friends to stay with, no reserve, cash reserves or assets? Must we wait for an eviction notice before we can assist them? Ultimately, um, you, there needs to be evidence that the person is at imminent risk of losing their current housing. Um, so if, um, uh, if the person is the uh, leaseholder, then evidence from uh, the landlord or owner that they intend to evict uh, this uh, household uh, for non-payment of rent or whatever the uh, lease uh, non-compliance issue is uh, needs to be obtained. Uh, this is um, Again, uh, this is sort of uh, important to show evidence that somebody isn't at uh, potential risk, but they are, in fact, at real risk of um, uh, losing their current housing uh, in a very sort of concrete way. Um, this uh, does not uh, necessarily mean, however, that uh, the eviction uh, process has to be uh, well underway or um, that uh, it needs to be, uh, you know, uh, filed and um, underway with uh, court proceedings, but rather uh, something uh, in uh, verified from the uh, landlord or owner um, that they uh, will proceed with evicting uh, the tenant if, uh, let's say, for example, uh, past due rent is not paid by a given date. Uh, some documentation like that is, um, is needed. I would just add to that, this is Susan, um, I would just add to that that an eviction notice, if you have an eviction notice for a household, that alone is not, does not make someone eligible for HPRP. And we've talked about this on different webinars, but I just want to make sure that point is clear too. Just because you have an eviction notice doesn't mean they meet the but-for standard and doesn't mean that they meet all of the eligibility criteria that Tom talked about. Um, so you do need to have additional information and documentation to make sure that you've documented and verified that they meet everything. And this is Christy. I'll just add to that, Susan. You know, we get a lot of questions through the help desk from people who, who have heard you make that statement before and ask, you know, what do you mean an eviction notice isn't enough? And, and just to, to expand a little bit on that, I, in going back to something Tom said earlier, most research shows that um, even people that have an eviction notice will do everything they can in their power to, of course, um, prevent pr from having to go to a shelter or, or ending up on the streets. And so that's, again, where that but for um, comes into play. So again, just because they have an eviction notice, you're still trying to identify if there are uh, different uh, financial resources, housing options, or um, support networks, relatives, family, friends that can help with the housing needs. So that's really what Susan means when she says the eviction notice is not enough. I do also want to point out that there's an FAQ on this topic. Um, folks should know that when we say an eviction notice is required, we're not saying a court-ordered eviction notice. It can be a statement from the landlord indicating you know, that the eviction um, process, they're going to proceed with the eviction um, process if payment isn't made by a particular date. The FAQ outlines what kind of information must be in that statement. So please double check the FAQs if you have uh, more questions on this issue. There, there is also uh, in the eligibility guidance, there's um, a specific um, um, information about what, what needs to be uh, on file with regard to a statement from a landlord. Okay. Uh, I, I so will just 
say one more thing about this, which is that um, you know the the issue of, of you know folks um, really exhausting all resources before coming into shelter is an important one for uh, grantees and subgrantees and really frontline staff to understand uh, in in terms of what HPRT is intended to do and what it's not not intended for. And ultimately, HPRT uh, is is really uh, it, it is meant to prevent literal homelessness. It is not meant to prevent doubling up or continued doubled up uh, situations uh, amongst um, uh, you know, low-income households. There are thousands of households in, um, in, um, across the country who live in doubled up situations because they lose their housing who will never uh, call and need emergency shelter. Uh, HPRP uh, cannot solve uh, the housing um, uh, issues and crises of uh, all the low-income families who are forced into doubled-up situations uh, each year. HPRP is not intended uh, to be that broad of a program. The resources are simply insufficient to do that. HPRP is intended, however, to serve families and individuals who are on the verge of needing emergency shelter or otherwise being literally homeless. But to add to that, Tom, and based on something you said just just a few moments ago, we're also not saying that you have, you know, that you have to force people into unstable housing situations. So if it's a you know family of six moving into grandma's you know tiny efficiency apartment, that's not a stable housing solution. So we're also not asking you to do that. We're, we're, as grantees and case managers, again, what what we're asking you to do is is use your professional judgment and make reasonable reasonable decisions and, and document those decisions. So um, quickly, let's, let's look at one other question before we move on. This is going back to uh, the first case study that Tom talked about uh, with Anna. And the question is, would Anna be eligible for HPRP assistance if she were renting a room from her sister? So in other words, are people who are renting a room from a family member eligible to receive assistance? Susan, do you want to talk a little bit about that one? Sure. Um, so. It you ha it, it, we're not saying that if you if you are renting a room from your sister that you can be eligible for HPRP assistance, but the documentation standard is a little bit higher, and um, I would make sure as a case manager that I ask a lot of questions about the specifics of each situation. So, for example, um, someone might say, "Oh, I'm." I'm uh, living with my sister and want to get rental assistance. We need to know, you would need to know what does living with, is, what does that mean? Is there a lease in place? Because we have said that there needs to be written, um, a written agreement, whether it's an occupancy agreement, a lease, something written that says the amount of money that is paid um, to the landlord each month has to be signed and dated by both parties. So. Um, you would need to make sure that's in place because otherwise it could be a conflict of interest. It could be a case of potential fraud. Um, so you would also want to make sure that, you know, you'd want to know whether the sister was living in the house, whether they were living off site, um, whether they, the two of them together would be considered a household because then, you know, you, what we've said again is that when you're considering two people as a household, you have to consider both of them um, together to receive HPRP assistance. So uh, you, you can't just look at one person's income and resources um, and support networks. You have to look at all of the two people together. So those are some of the considerations. Again, we wouldn't say, no, you can't rent from your sister in any case. But you do need to be careful about, again, what you're looking at. Yeah, and Susan, I'll just, I'll, I'll just add to that. Again, we see a lot of questions like this coming into the help desk. And if I were a case manager, I would I'd definitely approach this situation with a lot of caution. There's definitely the appearance of a conflict of interest on the surface. So there, I would definitely be asking a lot of questions about this scenario. Again, like Susan said, uh, you know, there's not always, there's a lot of gray here, and there's not always a one-size-fits-all response. I would want to know if Anna was living in the unit with her sister, in which case it it would be pretty hard to justify that the but-for rule 
you know, is being met because you'd have to prove that Anna really was going to, you know, put her out on the street if if the assistance wasn't uh, the, the rent wasn't paid. Um, a different case maybe if if Anna is actually renting a unit from her sister. Her sister, like Susan said, maybe lives somewhere else. She has has a history of um, payments between these two parties. Um, maybe Anna is a landlord and holds many units around the city, and she just happens to live in, in one of those units. So you can see there's a lot of different variations on, on the situation. And so if someone comes in and says, you know, my sister is my landlord, um, and they're applying for assistance as a case manager, you would want to ask a lot of questions to find out really what the situation is. Again, is there a history of, of rental monthly rental payments between these two parties? Um, Again, are they actually sharing the same unit, or are, is she really just subleasing a unit or renting a unit from this person? Those types of things. But, but I think the bottom line, as Susan said, is that it's um, it's not necessarily prohibited, but the onus is on you as a grantee to make sure that there isn't a conflict of interest. So with that, Tom, should we move forward with the slide? Yeah, let's move forward. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, rapid rehousing assistance. And um, I'm not going to go through all the uh, criteria, but I do want to point out, because uh, there has been some confusion around this, that um, the, the difference between whether um, uh, a household who is being assisted is receiving prevention assistance or rapid rehousing assistance all comes down to their housing status uh, at program entry, and specifically how that housing status is recorded in HMIS or a comparable data system. Um, so a person who is um, meeting the criteria for rapid rehousing assistance and who would be considered receiving rapid rehousing assistance, uh, also called homeless assistance in for reporting purposes, is somebody who would be designated as being literally homeless. Uh, as far as their housing status at program entry. That is uh, the first response category under the housing status data element. If you're indicated, if you're indicating someone to be literally homeless, then for reporting purposes or uh, uh, you know, how a person gets classified, that person is considered to be receiving rapid rehousing. Somebody who is a housing status other than literally homeless is in all cases considered to be receiving prevention assistance. They are housed in some fashion. Um, so somebody who is doubled up or couch surfing uh, or otherwise uh, housed in, uh, in need of assistance, uh, even if they're relocating to other housing from a doubled up situation or their own housing, that is not considered a rapid rehousing client. That's considered a prevention client, somebody who's being assisted to either maintain their current housing or relocate to new housing. That's a prevention client. Somebody who's literally homeless today and being served is being rehoused. Um, so moving on to the next slide, let's talk about uh, another example. John is a disabled veteran who has experienced long-term homelessness. John is staying at the local men's shelter and has no current income support networks, or other financial resources except $100 in checking. He's working with a local provider and will likely be able to move into a permanent supportive housing program in the next two to three months. John would like to receive treatment for a long-term problem with alcohol abuse. So the question is, is John eligible for HPRT rapid rehousing assistance? Uh, and the answer is, um, is yes, he may be eligible for rapid rehousing uh, assistance. Even though John um, looks like uh, in the next uh, two to three months, uh, he'll be entering a permanent supportive housing program, uh, John could still be assisted with HPRP assistance um, while he awaits uh, his final permanent housing placement. Uh, as HUD has indicated, persons who are assisted with uh, HPRP rapid rehousing assistance uh, retain their status as homeless for purposes of eligibility for other HUD programs. So in this case, for permanent supportive housing, uh, even if John were to move uh, into a unit 
uh, in the community with HPRP rental assistance um, in, as a bridge until a longer term, let's say, a shelter, in this case, a shelter plus care uh, subsidy is made available. Uh, John would still um, uh, be considered homeless for that shelter plus care uh, subsidy and, and uh, at least uh, in, in, as far as that's concerned, uh, still eligible uh, for shelter plus care even though he's now moved out of shelter into his own unit with temporary or bridge, uh, if you will, uh, assistance from the HPRP Rapid Rehousing uh, uh, Program. The important uh, way to think about this here is uh, does it make sense uh, for John, even though he's got permanent supportive housing in the, coming his way in the near term, to simply wait in shelter for two to three months? Is it in John's best interest? Is it a good use of system resources? Does it make sense to have John stay in emergency shelter while he awaits for that? Or uh, is, does it make sense and is it in John's interest to move him out of shelter uh, even temporarily while he awaits a permanent uh, assistance through the shelter care voucher. Uh, those are, are things that have to be uh, taken into account. And I would argue that in most cases it does not make any sense to let somebody simply uh, wait in shelter if HPRP is available as an option to move them out. It will free up your shelter resource. It will be in the better interest of that client uh, in the vast majority of cases, and it's simply a better use of system resources. Um, next slide, please. So how do we know who is mo uh, most likely to achieve stable housing? This is another area where there's been a lot of confusion. Um, as HUD wrote in the HPRP notice, HUD expects that HPRP resources will be targeted and prioritized to serve households that are most in need of temporary assistance and are most likely to achieve stable housing. Uh, HUD goes on to say in the notice that grantees and subgrantees may also consider the expected ability of program participants to achieve stable housing, unsubsidized or subsidized, outside of HBRP. Um, the emphasis here is that this is the whether or not uh, an applicant um, can be uh, demonstrated to have a future ability to sustain housing. In, in, by virtue of some assessment is not required by HUD. You do not have to um, screen out, in other words, uh, persons who have no income, who have significant barriers, uh, who will be a challenge to work with, who will require more program resources. Uh, HUD is not expecting uh, or requiring that persons with higher needs uh, or with less resources uh, are screened out from HBRP assistance. Ultimately, this is about what is the right fit uh, for that uh, applicant. And if there is a better, uh, more appropriate uh, service or housing resource in the community to meet an applicant's needs, then by all means that applicant should be linked to that resource. Uh, if, however, that resource isn't immediately avail available or if uh, that resource simply doesn't exist, then HPRP uh, still can be uh, used to assist even persons who might be better suited uh, for permanent supportive housing if permanent supportive housing isn't available or isn't immediately available. Uh, ultimately, uh, this is a case-by-case -case decision, um, and it, it does um, uh, depend on the individual uh, client needs as well as what other options are available. And a good way to think about this is, are we the best resource? Uh, if I'm a program, I would ask myself, am I the best resource for this applicant? Or is there something else in the community that's a better resource uh, for this applicant in the near term and the long term? Um, so, just to stress again, grantees and subgrantees should be cautious not to exclude households who may be appropriately served by HBRP simply because they presently lack income uh, and, and the financial means to sustain housing and or are assessed to have significant barriers to sustain housing. Remember, HBRP assistance is flexible and persons with greater needs 
can receive greater assistance. Uh, it just might be for a longer period of time uh, or uh, more intense um, or a more rich subsidy uh, in order to help them get back on their feet. And that's okay. The uh, HPRP uh, was designed to uh, allow grantees and subgrantees uh, to be as flexible as possible in terms of the type, level, and duration of assistance within the broader sort of constraints of HPRP. Um, so let's uh, look at uh, some more case scenarios, if we could. Um, so case scenario three, um, Mary and Bill and their three children have been staying in the local family shelter for three weeks. Neither Mary or Bill presently work and both have only inconsistently worked in the past two years. They've received TANF cash benefits, food stamps, and SSI for their son, as well as Medicaid. They would like to find housing and get their life in order, but they don't know where to begin. They feel demoralized, and they seem to lack motivation. So a program would need to ask, is HPRP assistance right for Mary and, Mary and Bill. And let's just uh, presume for a moment that they meet the eligibility, the base eligibility criteria. In this case, even though Mary and Bill have uh, inconsistently worked and don't have um, uh, enough income presently uh, to sustain housing uh, without assistance, does not mean that Mary and Bill are not good candidates for HPRP. Um, they clearly have uh, many issues going on. Uh, they may require more frequent and, and uh, uh, more uh, intensive uh, assistance. Uh, they might be the, the family that gets referred to the more seasoned staff uh, who is able to work with more complex uh, issues and barriers. Um, the important thing here is that clearly Mary and Bill have issues that go beyond as well um, the, um, the resources and uh, capacity of HPRP to uh, resolve all the barriers they may uh, be confronted with. Uh, however, that's not to uh, mean that HPRP shouldn't be used to help them get out of shelter, get on their feet, get stabilized in housing, and get linked to other assistance in the community uh, that can help them in the longer term. And so those are the types of considerations uh, that a program would want to think through as they're trying to assess whether or not HPRP is right for Marionville. Um, so let's move on to some more questions, if we could. And Christy, I'm going to throw it back to you. OK. Tom, we're getting a lot of questions from people who are, are wanting you to talk a little bit more about um, individuals that have no income. Um, you know, one person asks, um, so for example, you know, what, what do we do with people that come to us that have no income and that we know really won't be able to um, become stable during the term of the assistance? Do we just pay their entire rent for a specific amount of time, or, or how do we handle that? And another person asks, what is the most effective way to exit a client from the program who has not put forth effort towards gaining self-sufficiency? Without HPRP assistance, they'll become homeless, but they're also not working. Um, to become self-sufficient? So on the first question, um, you know, HPRP, as I mentioned, is, uh, is meant to be uh, flexible. And ultimately, a grantee needs to decide, and, and sub-grantees need to decide, um, within the constraints of HPRP, what are your sort of maximum service levels that, that you allow for. Um, HPRP can, in fact, be used to um, subsidize uh, a household at 100% of their uh, monthly rental costs if that's uh, needed uh, in order to uh, sustain them in housing while they uh, work on removing barriers and uh, increasing their income and or obtaining other uh, longer term uh, housing subsidies. So you can uh, certainly, uh, you know, apply a greater levels of HPRP assistance to uh, households um, in those types of cases. I would just suggest that, um, number one, it's important to build in that type of flexibility and allow for that type of, of flexibility um, uh, for certain uh, situations. It's also important to document uh, the decisions that, um, uh, that cause a higher level of assistance to be used 
and, um, and to have some justification uh, for that in the case file. Uh, and this is really about sort of uh, fair and, and transparent uh, decision making of why one household might get a different level or type of assistance than uh, another. Uh, at the same time, it's important for grantees um, to be clear with subgrantees when that type of discretion is uh, allowable and um, what sorts of um, uh, considerations or expectations a grantee may have for subgrantees uh, when they're uh, sort of using uh, higher levels of uh, assistance versus uh, lower levels. In terms of um, when it's um, how to sort of uh, terminate uh, services for a household who's simply not um, uh, doing uh, anything in terms of um, uh, their longer term uh, issues or barriers or uh, just even following a, a case plan, uh, I would suggest this, this really just comes down. There is no sort of a formulaic uh, way to do this. Uh, this ultimately comes down to uh, sort of the art of um, of, uh, of the work that we do and the casework uh, that, that we engage in with uh, families and individuals. And it's about finding creative ways uh, to motivate households. Uh, certainly there's uh, some different uh, techniques out there. Motivational uh, interviewing is, is one such technique uh, to engage uh, a household uh, in a process to resolve their problems um, where they're equal, uh, their, their uh, partners uh, in that process. Um, but there is no uh, easy answer. I would suggest, however, that um, it's important to just from a uh, practice uh, standpoint uh, to uh, frame these types of decisions as um, uh, decisions that ultimately the client has a choice in. Uh, so a client uh, can choose not to follow their case plan. Uh, and if a client chooses not to follow their case plan, and uh, address uh, issues that will um, uh, that are uh, relevant to them, then they they may also uh, be choosing uh, to not participate in the program if that's a program uh, requirement. Uh, so I think it, it it's important to frame uh, these types of decisions as um, uh, being uh, really uh, client choices and to um, uh, predict for uh, a client uh, what. Uh, certain uh, outcomes might be depending on what choices are made. Um, so clients have uh, full knowledge and awareness of the consequence of their own um, decisions. Uh, but ultimately, uh, it is important to um, uh, really uh, just sort of uh, meet folks where they're at and uh, um, you know uh, give them those options. Tom, uh, this is Susan. I sorry to interrupt for one second there, but. Um, it actually is really important that the HPRP notice requires that um, grantees have a written termination policy in place. So you have to have, um, when you are terminating a client from a program for any reason, whether it's because they don't um, meet your requirement that if you had one in place that they had to do certain things, um, or if they were at the three-month reassessment, they were not eligible um, and you weren't able to document that eligibility, I think it's really important that we, that you as a grantee be clear up front what the expectations are for all program participants. And then you need to be clear why each household is being terminated from the program. And so the, the notice actually requires that you issue a written um, termination notice and there's a couple other steps. We have an, um, an FAQ on it, I believe, and we also, um, if you read the HPRP notice, it's in there so that there is there is some requirement in terms of the, the policy that you have in place regarding termination. Susan, I would just add to that um, what we're hearing from some of the programs around the country, they're using an agreement, um, signing an agreement with their clients at the beginning of the program outlining, you know, what their responsibilities as providers are, what the responsibilities of the, of the, the client are, and just sort of how the program will work. I can't underscore enough how important the communication piece is with your clients so they understand exactly what to expect, um, how long the assistance lasts, what the recertification process is, when that happens, what needs to happen, so they can also, you know, plan 
for their future as they move forward under this program. Um, I know I think we're running you know a little bit behind on time, so why don't we move forward? I know we're going to take questions at, at one other point, but let's move forward into the next set of slides. Great. So now we're going to talk just uh, for a few minutes about service design and um, delivery. And there's a few principles related to HBRP service design and delivery we want to quickly review. Um, first of all, uh, this notion of um, uh, targeting and uh, ultimately uh, targeting services or, or you know, providing services um, that are most uh, impactful with regard to the specific housing barriers. Uh, that a household uh, is facing is, is really uh, key. HPRP is not a panacea for poverty. HPRP will not solve uh, poverty. HPRP is designed to focus on housing barriers, those um, specific barriers that either uh, prevent uh, a person from obtaining housing. Uh, you can also think of these as tenant screening barriers, uh, those, those characteristics that uh, a landlord will deny a tenant on. Uh, because they don't want to rent to somebody with uh, past evictions, so or they don't want to rent to somebody with a criminal history, or they don't want to uh, rent to somebody with poor credit, as well as um, barriers that uh, are uh, that uh, uh, prohibit a household from maintaining housing. So housing retention barriers is, is another set of barriers, and these might be barriers uh, related to, of course, just simply paying uh, rent itself or affording uh, rent or uh, maintaining uh, the unit in, in, a, uh, uh, in a manner that uh, comports with the lease, or uh, not having uh, loud parties that, that uh, interfere with the peaceful enjoyment of uh, neighbors, uh, which might uh, result in a, a, a lease uh, noncompliance issue. HRP should be uh, used and, and assistance should be directed to removing or mitigating those barriers uh, as much as possible. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is this notion of just enough. As, as I mentioned, HPRP is really not designed to, to ad address all the issues that low-income families and individuals are facing. Um, so in this manner, we should be thinking about HPRP as um, providing the minimal amount of assistance so a family's barriers are removed or mitigated and they are on, you know, relatively decent footing to maintain their housing uh, once assistance ends. Uh, it's important uh, to think about this in terms of um, not only where a household needs to be, but what resources in the community a household should be linked to uh, to provide long-term uh, support, or what resources in a community a household needs to be aware of so when they have a future housing crisis, which surely uh, most low-income families will, um, that they know where to turn, and they know where to turn and when to turn to a resource early enough uh, to address their needs before they blow up into a crisis where they're about to become homeless. Um, so the intent of HDRP, again, is not to resolve all issues, all barriers, but rather get households on a stable enough footing so the same uh, critical sort of crisis, housing crisis that led them to initially qualify for HPRP uh, doesn't recur. Um, ultimately, um, there, there is, uh, uh, it, it is important to uh, link uh, households to other resources uh, simply just to maximize HPRP. So the just enough uh, principle is also about stretching HPRP as much as we can to serve as many households uh, as we can and still achieve uh, the objectives of HPRP. Um, next slide, please. With regard to financial assistance, we did touch on this um, uh, as well, but it's important to think about uh, rental assistance uh, considerations um, with regard to um, individual need as well as um, providing only what's necessary to stabilize housing. Uh, there are um, lots of grantees who have imposed uh, caps on the amount of rental assistance. I mean, of course, uh, rental assistance can't be in excess of uh, uh, rent comparables uh, for a given uh, unit. Um, but beyond that, uh, a grantee may decide that they're going to limit rental assistance to only uh, a certain amount. 
um, ultimately that will affect how many uh, can be can be served. Um, I would suggest that um, decisions should be based or at least may be based on the severity of the client's barriers to retaining housing and that there's flexibility uh, to do that as we've we've discussed. Um, next slide please. So let's talk about um, another brief uh, case example. Keisha and her son have been in the local family shelter for five days. They have no income, no financial resources, and insufficient support networks to obtain housing. Keisha has some work history and is eligible for public assistance. Uh, she may have a substance abuse problem, but staff are unsure. Um, they are on the wait list for public housing, and it's possible that a unit will be available in six to nine months. What, so the question here is, what's the appropriate type, level, and duration of assistance uh, for this family? Um, it's important to remember that programs cannot obligate assistance uh, in increments greater than three months. Uh, eligibility and need needs to be reassessed uh, and recertified at least every three months. Uh, so in Keisha's uh, case, a program could commit to providing a few months of rental assistance uh, while uh, uh, Keisha is um, getting uh, into housing and is starting to address uh, her barriers um, and perhaps um, uh, working on getting a job and applying for public assistance uh, and maybe even uh, starting to engage in treatment for a substance abuse uh, problem. Uh, ultimately, however, um, um, you know, if she has a, a public housing unit that might be available uh, in six to nine months, uh, that certainly should be incorporated into uh, the case plan. The question uh, then becomes, you know, does she have to and, and is it uh, necessary that she remain on HPRP uh, assistance or with some level of HPRP assistance until she obtains that um, uh, public housing unit or is it possible to uh, even transition her off of HPRP uh, before that? And those are the considerations that uh, would need to be made in this, this example. Um, let's move on because I know we're short on time. Uh, and just briefly, um, coordination with mainstream and community-based services. I just want to stress that um, it is important to uh, not only have sort of program level partnerships uh, with various um, uh, resources in the community and those could be formal partnerships um, uh, and referral relationships or they can be less formal uh, but nonetheless there's an array of um, providers and resources in, in almost every community that are important partners for HPRP programs. These, of course, include the public assistance agencies, uh, local housing authorities, uh, landlords and landlord networks such as apartment associations are critical partners, uh, the VA, other veteran services uh, organizations, and then other homeless prevention providers. Uh, so in cases where somebody doesn't meet HPRP uh, criteria or the but for provision, but for provision, rather, uh, they can be uh, immediately referred to uh, prevent another prevention provider who's a partner with the HPRP program. Uh, in any event, having partnerships uh, is really core to HPRP. HPRP is not meant uh, to operate in a vacuum. Um, let's talk very quickly about some related tips on the next slide. Um, it is important to train staff on other community resources and programs to ensure the best fit for the participant. As we mentioned earlier, that's really part of the decision making that goes into the initial needs assessment. Is HPRP the best resource for a given participant? Um, in that light, it's important to, to consider what HPRP can do and what it can't do, what it's not designed to do. And that's important for both staff and participants uh, to understand and have uh, a clear sense about. Um, ultimately, um, this is, uh, you know, HUD would uh, like to see HPRP maximized to the extent it can uh, help uh, connect folks uh, expeditiously with other uh, resources uh, in the community and then when needed uh, provide a higher uh, degree of assistance to households based on um, need. Uh, the other sort of related tip is that one way uh, to uh, keep the emphasis on HPRP as a short-term program is to use the recertification. 
uh, process uh, that has to occur at least every three months as a, uh, a, a facet of the case plan. So for example, case plan could be constructed in, in a uh, sort of a three-month uh, time frame for somebody who's needing more than just one-time assistance. And at the end of three months, uh, there could be intention built into the case plan around reexamining uh, both need and eligibility uh, to determine whether or not um, HPRP assistance should be tapered back or should be discontinued altogether if there's other resources now in place uh, that have been accessed in the community. Next slide, please. Ultimately, um, if, if, a, uh, if a program is unsure of whether or not uh, there are other resources, or if there simply aren't other resources in the community to refer an eligible applicant uh, to who might have greater needs, um, then I would argue it's better to err on the side of screening in versus screening out. As I mentioned earlier, if the alternative is to let somebody simply sit in shelter until some other option becomes available that is probably unlikely to happen, then that's really not an option at all. It's better, and I would like to see HPRP assistance used aggressively to pull people out of shelter, place them in housing, even if uh, that's somewhat of a risk because someone has uh, significant barriers or issues. Um, but it, it really goes back to the question of, is there another more appropriate uh, housing or service option in the community that somebody should be directed to? If the answer is no or it's not available now, then err on the side of screening in, err on the side of getting somebody out of a shelter versus leaving them in it. Um, training staff on other community-based and mainstream resources uh, to ensure needs are met is also important, again, on the back end of HPRP, not just on the front end. Um, this type of um, decision-making and thinking about it in terms of is HPRP the right fit also uh, has relevance in terms of identifying system gaps. So if it's determined that you know, a certain number of applicants really would be more appropriately served and might even uh, be eligible for permanent supportive housing, but there's insufficient supply of permanent supportive housing, and the HPRP program is uh, uh, absorbing uh, such clients, then that's, that's powerful data uh, to use uh, for system planning uh, purposes. Um, bottom line, again, this still comes down to staff training and supervision, uh, and, and it's important to continually refine uh, decision-making and processes and use case examples, real-life case examples that are occurring in your programs as a way to, as a learning mechanism uh, for staff. Um, now we're going to maybe take a few more questions. Christy, I don't know if we've got some more coming in around service design and delivery or if we'd uh, want to push on through. Um, lots of questions around uh, clarifying policies and rules. What I would suggest to people is um, if you haven't taken time to look through the FAQs, please please take time to review the FAQs on the HRE. Um, I know we haven't posted any new ones for a while. There is a batch coming. Um, one question that we do have, Tom, is, is, is sort of another conflict of interest question. We have um, the person poses, can a relative of staff working with the HPRP program qualify for rental assistance if they meet all qualifying criteria? Um, and and a, as a related component that I'll just throw in, we often get the question, can HPRP staff qualify for assistance? So I don't know, Tom, or Susan, if you want to take, take that one. I can take that one. Um, a relative of a staff person, like this, like we talked about before, with if you're renting from, you have someone renting from their sister, you, a relative of a staff person, can, is not automatically ineligible for HPRP. So in other words, they could potentially receive HPRP assistance, but you do have to make sure that first of all, the staff person whose relative is applying for assistance that staff person is not doing the assessment. Um, you would need to make sure that somebody who's removed has no relationship with that individual or household um, is doing the assessment, makes sure to document everything. And I even would say in the case file, make it clear up front that this person is related to a staff member and has been determined to be eligible 
separate from the staff person. So again, it's it's something that you know sometimes it can't be avoided, but um, you want to be very very careful around documenting it. Um, the same thing with a staff person of HPRP. Uh, you, we've had the question come in before where somebody who works for, let's say you have a big organization uh, who's um, a sub-grantee of HPRP and they're running the program, um, you might have a staff person who works in uh, the accounting department or somebody who you know, works in a different part of the agency who doesn't work directly on HPRP. Maybe they work on a different program. Um, again, that person is not automatically ineligible, but you would need to be very, very clear up front about the status and the situation that that person is in, that they are a, an employee of the organization that is providing the assistance, that they are determined to be eligible because of the, each of the eligibility pieces have been documented. Thanks, Susan. Um, I know we don't have much time. I, I do want to pose one other question that, that we're, we're seeing. Um, this is around the issue of recertification. I think there's some confusion among folks um, between the concepts of identifying sort of a longer-term plan for someone thinking about how much assistance they may need to get stabilized versus actually, um, so you're sort of budgeting, earmarking in your budget how much assistance a particular household may need versus actually approving that assistance up front. So what the, the question is, um, how long can they, how, how long as a grantee can you grant assistance to a household? At one point during the webinar, one of the presenters mentioned it was possible to grant one year of assistance. At another point, a presenter said only three months of assistance can be obligated at a time. Um, can you clarify? Well, ultimately, this comes down to sort of maximum allowable assistance and, and at the same time, the maximum amount of assistance that can be uh, obligated uh, at any point in time. And so um, it, it's possible uh, at the onset to determine via an assessment that, you know, it's likely that somebody will need um, more than three months of assistance, and uh, you could certainly discuss that as a possibility. However, a program cannot obligate or commit to uh, providing more than three months of assistance at any uh, at any uh, increment, uh, simply because eligibility has to be recertified at least every three months, and at the same time, need the need for HPRP assistance uh, needs to be reassessed. And so I might say to a family, um, it looks like, you know, if you're, you're getting a, uh, you're on the public housing uh, waiting list and it looks like you're going to get into that unit in six to nine months, um, let's uh, start a case plan and uh, we'll move you, help you find housing, uh, we'll provide, you know, a certain amount of uh, rental assistance and we'll commit to doing that uh, for the next uh, few months, but no, no more than three months. And at that point, uh, we'll reassess things. We'll make sure you're still eligible for assistance. And if you still need assistance at that point, um, then uh, w you might be approved for that assistance. However, we can't commit to that at this time, and let's just take this one month at a time. I think that's really important, not just simply uh, because uh, of the eligibility uh, issue and redetermination, but also because we are, uh, it, it really is a way to keep the focus on we're providing, um, as, as, you know, the least amount of assistance to achieve a certain goal. And so I, I you know, I wouldn't uh, uh, make it, um, I, I would keep the focus on let's try to uh, get you on stable footing as quickly as possible and to use the least amount of HPRP assistance as, as we possibly can uh, so, so we're, uh, you know, reserving assistance for other households who might need it. Um, and, and that's really sort of the, the difference between the two is you can't obligate more than three months, uh, but you certainly can um, in, in some total provide more than three months and up to 18 months of, uh, in this case, rental assistance um, you know, for a given household. Great. So um, let's move on. Yeah, just, um, 
the last thing I'll say on this and before I pass back to Susan is, is I like to think about uh, the HBRP challenge as sort of summing up in, in the, uh, one statement, which is providing the right resources to the right people at the right point in time for the right amount of time. And ultimately, this is a challenge uh, that, that's very uh, dynamic, and it, it, there is no formulaic uh, solution for it. It really comes down to uh, individual program design and case-by-case -case, um, decision making. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Susan. All right. Thanks, Tom. So I have just a little bit of time and a lot of material to get through, so I'm going to try to zip through it a little bit. Um, we, we at HUD, we've started monitoring HPRP grantees, and we're finding some common themes around the countries that are coming up. So I want to talk about some of these themes so that you can address them in your community as they're occurring. Uh, and if you do find that you have questions or concerns about some of the things we're talking about, please contact either your local HUD field office, your desk officer here at headquarters, or submit a question to the help desk, and we'll take it from there. So let's start by talking about rent reasonableness and moving cost assistance. Some communities are just paying the fair market rent and assuming that it automatically meets the rent reasonableness test. We found that um, a couple places that's happening that we know of. Um, but I want to be clear that the two standards are not the same thing. FMRs are set for each jurisdiction at the 40th percentile, which means that the FMR amount is sufficient to cover rental charges for only 40% of the housing units in a given area. So that means, of course, that the FMR, there's over half of the units that aren't um, covered by the FMR. But you know, because especially because the goal of a, per, of a homelessness prevention program is to keep people housed, using the FMR as a payment standard can reduce the ability to serve a whole lot of people. So again, you know, in contrast, the rent reasonableness standard is more flexible and can allow grantees to serve more households. Also, especially in rural areas, sometimes a reasonable rent to pay for a comparable unit is, could be below the FMR. So um, you, know, you want to make sure that you're paying something that's reasonable. Um, and also, the FMR doesn't account for units in different neighborhoods or, or that have different amenities. So, Again, if you're using FMR to cap a payment, it still doesn't tell you whether the rent is being charged, the rent that's being charged for a unit is reasonable or not. So you do need to make sure you're using the rent reasonable and a standard, and we have some uh, resources on the HRE that can help you think about that. Um, we've also found that when we go out to monitor, some grantees are not doing any rent reasonableness checks when providing homelessness prevention assistance. So again, it's required that you do the check in both prevention and rapid rehousing. Um, and you know you want to make sure that that also that the rent that someone is paying is going to be sustainable for them in the long run. Now, third, we've also found that um, moving costs are not necessarily always uh, documented, and that they're not always reasonable, or, or that they are reasonable. That's not documented. So we know that, of course a moving cost that's reasonable is going to be different depending on where you live in the country or even as part of the city that you live in. But again, we need people um, doing these assessments and providing the assistance to make sure that they have checked and ensured that they're not paying exorbitant prices with federal funds. So you could, for example, um, you could develop a form at the grantee level and make sure all the subgrantee staff are checking rates from a few different companies every time just like the sample rent reasonableness checklist that we've provided. Um, again, that's not required, but it's a checklist that the checklist is used, but it's a sample. Um, or you could check a number of companies up front and estimate a given rate that's reasonable for your area. And then, you know, knowing that the moving cost is within that um, amount, it could be considered reasonable. So we're not going to tell you exactly how it has to be done. Um, again, it's the beauty of the flexibility of HPRP. But when we come out to monitor, we need to see documentation that the check was completed to make sure it's reasonable and that you have justified the cost that was approved. Another thing that we found um, is that there's not sufficient supporting documentation for draws that the grantee makes. Sometimes there's a minimal amount of documentation, but it just doesn't go far enough so that you as a grantee 
can ensure that the expenses that were paid are eligible. So like in some cases, a grantee might just be seeing a check that was cut by the subgrantee, um, making sure the amounts match up, and then you draw that amount. That's not really enough um, to ensure from the grantee side that, you know, that the expense is eligible. In some cases, subgrantees could be missing documentation. Um, the files aren't complete. You know, you need to make sure, and we found that as we've gone out to monitor again, you need to make sure that the grantee is verifying that things are eligible, that they are drawing federal funds for. Next, we've also found that the three-month recertification of eligibility is not being done consistently. Um, again, you have to check that the participant at three months still has no subsequent housing options, they still have no financial resources, and no support networks, and that they are still at or below 50% of area median income. So again, one thing the grantee could do is create a standard form so that every case manager that's doing those re the recertifications um, checks off that they've verified all the requirements. Um, further, actually now that the 2010 income limits have been released, when you do the recertification, make sure that um, you're using the new standards. And you can see the website on the screen is, shows where the, you can find the new standards. So if someone actually, if they're over the limit when you reassess them, at that point, they cannot be served with HPRP funds and you'd have to terminate from the program. So, um, and lastly, make sure that you're documenting to the very best of your ability that when you're paying more, that you're not paying um, more than six months of arrears for rent or for utilities. Now, when we go, again, when we go out to monitor, we're gonna be looking for bills from the utility company, a letter from the landlord, um, which should be notarized or on official letterhead, and signed and dated. Now, I understand that in some places, utility, utility companies will not provide itemized lists of past bills with the month-by-month -month cost. So in that case, you could try to estimate the monthly utility expense based on the current month that you have um, or based on a, even, at the very least, a statement from the program participant. But you need to justify why you paid the portion of the bill that you did and that you, did, you, you need to document that to the best of your ability, you tried to find out what the six months um, of arrears cost would be and estimate that if you can't find out. But um, the case manager should make a note in the case file to, that they have attempted to contact the utility company and could not obtain documentation. Continuing the documentation that we've, and I'm harping on this because we've, like I said, we've been out monitoring and haven't um, necessarily seen it done consistently. So I wanna, and those are findings when we go out um, and write up those letters if you don't have things documented properly. So with hotel and motel vouchers, you want to make sure that you're documenting all three criteria that must be met. So you need to check that, first of all, there are no appropriate shelter beds available, um, and whether that's calling the shelters that take the, you know, let's say you're working with a family with children, um, maybe calling all the shelters in the area that work with families and children, and documenting that none of them had space available. And you need to make sure that you have identified a unit for the program participants to move into before they get the motel or hotel voucher. Uh, you know, we've talked about this a lot. Um, HPRP is not a motel or hotel voucher program, and that's why it's so very limited. Um, it really is a program that's meant to help people find stable housing and get into that stable housing quickly. And lastly, you want to make sure that you're documenting that if they were provided with a voucher, um, for motel hotel help that they stayed no longer than 30 days there. Um, and next, I just want to reiterate quickly um, the requirement that a lead-based paint visual assessment must be done if you're providing a household with HPRP financial assistance, whether it's prevention assistance or rapid rehousing. In both cases, you have to do a lead paint visual assessment when you have a family with children under the age of six and the housing was constructed before 1978. Now, it's confusing because then you, you don't have to do a habitability check if the participant household will be remaining in their current housing under homelessness prevention. But again, you do have to do a lead paint visual assessment if the preconditions I mentioned are met. So um, we've, again, found that hasn't been documented 
or done consistently. And um, you know, one grantee that we monitored had actually provided checklists to all of its subs. So they're doing all of these. I mentioned that before, but they had trained everyone on the requirements and made sure that every subgrantee case manager that was doing these assessments and doing these checks, it's all documented in the case file and verified um, and followed up on. All right, let's move on to challenges that we've heard people um, talk about that they've had in spending the HPRP funds. We actually recently issued a call for presenters for the upcoming fall um, HUD trainings in Denver and Atlanta, and we received over 20 self-identified community-level best practices from the community. So we've, we actually developed the next few slides based on what we've learned from this and from monitoring. Um, some of the, most of the challenges can be put into four categories. Staffing challenges, which include usually inadequate staff resources, um, often because of the budget cuts and you know, force reductions in staff that have been going on all over the country. Also, the second one is program programmatic or process bottlenecks. Um, because it's new, HPRP has forced agencies to collaborate and work together without the benefit of having a prior relationship or process in place. You know, sometimes the continuum of care um, is a good resource here, but not always. And it, um, you know, it, and a lot of times it's actually the lack of these relationships has slowed the process of cutting checks and slowed down the process of serving clients. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit. The third key is targeting and outreach, which Tom talked about in great detail. But we know that many grantees develop programs targeting a specific population. So um, you know, now a lot of them are realizing the need to refocus because who they're seeing come in is not who they expected to see come in for assistance. And lastly, um, looking at eligibility criteria, again, a lot of communities actually did develop their program with more restrictive eligibility criteria than the HUD minimum. Or a lot of people misinterpreted HUD's targeting guidance, and they are as a requirement that participants prove that they'll be able to sustain their housing at the end of the HPRP assistance. So this has prevented some households from being eligible for HPRP who might otherwise have been, and it's slowed down spending. In terms of staffing, um, you know, we know that grantees and subgrantees are doing more with less staff. It's happening all over, and we understand. Um, obviously, the most obvious solution is if you can hire staff, you know, hire more staff. But unfortunately, it's not possible or even maybe desirable in a lot of cases. So if you can't hire more staff, a lot of communities have found that collaboration among partner agencies has helped to ease the overburdening of staff. For example, maybe you could have one staff person float from agency to agency to provide additional help, even if it's just one day a week. Um, or you could have maybe have agencies specialize in what they do best. For example, um, maybe one central organization can cut the checks, but other partners provide services. One partner can do inspections, et cetera. And then at that point, case managers can make sure they're efficiently referring potential program participants to um, the correct agency, depending on what the need is. Um, also, a lot of communities have found that creating a central point of intake, whether it's in person or on a, the telephone, for example, a 211 number, um, that's helped with staffing challenges. So it alleviates the burden on case managers because they only see you know, if there's a pre-screening process in place, which I know a lot of communities do, then the case managers only see households that are more likely to be a prime candidate for HPRP. And lastly, um, in, in general, a lot of grantees have had to shift staff, re-examine their processes, change their intake processes, and, and just generally um, be flexible about the way that they're implementing the program. So I mentioned briefly the programmatic and process bottlenecks that can happen um, when grantees and subgrantees that don't normally work together have to start working together because of HPRP. So one thing that some communities have done 
is they've developed a policy and procedural procedures manual to outline how the program is going to work in the community and make sure that they're clear about the processes, what happens when a potential client comes in, um, is there a common intake form, you know, how does reimbursement happen, there's tons and tons of questions about the process. And if staff aren't knowledgeable at every level or any level, it can slow down the process of actually getting the assistance out to the, to the people who need the assistance most. You know, a lot of times communities will update their manuals, make sure that they're providing regular trainings and holding meetings with the subgrantees um, to get that information out. Another um, tool for overcoming pro programmatic challenges is monitoring. A lot of grantees have not yet monitored their subgrantees, but when they do, they find that they've actually have a new, a new appreciation for understanding how the program is implemented, and they can see where processes need to be changed a little bit or um, adjusted so that the, because the processes are the thing that's holding up getting money out the door and serving clients. And lastly, um, communication is another thing that people said from those surveys that is the key to running a more efficient program. For example, I mentioned having monthly meetings between the grantee and the subgrantees, or more frequent team meetings. And if you're in a large geographic area and you can't always get an in-person meeting, conference calls work, um, or using technology such as Google Groups, um, internet sites, etc. Also, just so you know, just to make a note, that sometimes field offices will offer to host those calls or meetings as well. So, you know, that not only strengthens the communication between the grantee and subgrantees, but between the field office as well. So I think most of them, if you just ask, would be happy to host a call like that. And um, in terms of targeting, we've talked a lot about this, and we're running out of time, so I'm actually going to skip through this a little bit. Just thinking about, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's the, the population that the community, like I said, expected to serve um, is not the population that comes in. So sometimes also the problem is trying to find landlords to rent to the clients that you see coming in. So for example, um, some communities have conducted proactive informational sessions with officials, utility companies, et cetera, and landlords. Um, some have conducted in-reach, quote unquote, at other human service agencies or sitting a staff person at a Homeless Connect event. Um, some communities have found that working with staff in other public agencies, such as schools or local utility companies, helps those other people in those other organizations know about HPRP and know where to refer people. Um, and then just distributing information to highlight the program um, and success stories. For example, one in one case, the utility company even agreed to put a flyer in a utility bill that went out to all customers. So talking about some best practices around eligibility criteria, again, we went over this very in detail, but um, you know, I think the key here is if um, you know, using standardized assessment tools for everyone to use to ensure consistency across the program, um, you know, and, and being flexible if you, the people that you expected to serve and where you initially targeted um, with HPRP funds are not the people who are showing up, then make sure, you know, reevaluate and retool your eligibility criteria to make sure you can move the money quickly. All right, I have about five minutes or so to get through fraud. And this is arguably the most important section of this presentation. Um, fraud has been a big issue with HPRP from the beginning. We've actually had cases of fraud already occur early on in the program, um, and that's why we emphasize it so much. Um, for some people, it's, it's difficult to see why having these written policies and procedures aren't in place is so important. Um, but, you know, these are, in some cases, like I said, it, it um, is really 
you know, like I said, it's, we're coming up with um, fraud, and we need to, need to make sure that we're on top of it before the IG comes in. So, um, I'm going to move on to the next slide. We've actually, on this slide, we've actually had all of the things on this slide listed occur. So, um, putting processes in place, the internal controls for cutting checks, having that staff certification form, um, having cross checks all throughout your process, those are all important um, for preventing fraud. All right. So here's a real example of um, one community agency. Agency A was processing a check according to the routine internal audit controls for check writing when the accounting assistant discovered something strange. Agency A had established a local policy that HPRP financial assistance would be limited to three months of rent and utilities assistance except for in extenuating circumstances. The accounting assistant was processing the purchase requisition that was approved and submitted by the case manager. When she noticed this request was actually the fourth such request for rental assistance for this client. She knew that the policy limited assistance to three months in most cases, so she brought the matter to the attention of Agency A's executive director and asked if it was indeed the intention to make a fourth payment, which would have been unprecedented. The executive director called in the case manager who had requested the expenditure and asked for an explanation of the extenuating circumstances that were supposed to be present. The case manager became evasive and actually defensive. When confronted about this behavior, the case manager admitted that the client in question was her mother. When confronted about the action being a brief breach of professional ethics, also a conflict of interest in violation of the agency's local policy and in violation of the staff affidavit, which is now called the Declaration of Client Eligibility, the case manager said, well, actually she wasn't the only case manager who had provided for services for, to family members. She provided the name of another case manager, um, and the executive director called this person in as well. This other case manager admitted also to placing a client in an apartment building of which she was the resident manager. Upon internal investigation, it was discovered that indeed the mother of the first case manager did not meet the eligibility prerequisites for HPRP, and we talked about this. Um, they have to make sure that they meet the eligibility requirements. In the second incident, the case manager had provided services to her son, daughter, and a cousin, all of who did not meet the eligibility requirements. So in this instance, as a whole, the agency, Agency A, did a lot of things right. They're all listed in the example and on this slide, um, including they had processes in place, audit controls. They, um, the staff met regularly at least once a week for training and clarification regarding the required forms and, and procedures to follow. So here's a few um, fraud prevention tips. Basically, the, the purpose of having these systems in place is to prevent the misuse of funds. First, agencies looking to implement their own fraud prevention strategies could follow Agency A's example by implementing internal audit control, controls for check writing. Also, you could do a spot check of evictions and three-day notices by either sending a letter or calling each landlord um, with, about their payments to ensure that eviction um, notice or a three- or five-day notice was actually given. Um, agencies or case managers could also check the county's website to verify that the entity receiving payments is actually the property owner. Um, and also, you may want to run data quality reports from the HMIS to check against your files. Now, if you do find that fraud has occurred, um, or if you suspect that fraud is occurring, um, you can contact your local police. Um, you should notify your local HUD field office, and you should notify the HUD Office of Inspector General. If you discover that fraud has occurred, you do need to terminate assistance to a program participant um, if they've violated the program requirements. And we do have FAQs about this, and you have the contact information for the IG. If you do have any questions or suspicions, make sure to just, um, they'll be happy to help you out. That concludes most of the, um, the presentation. I want to just direct you to the resources 
that are available. When you, if you have questions about this, again, I mentioned you can contact your local field office, contact your HUD headquarters desk officer, um, or you can submit questions to the virtual help desk and make sure that you're looking at the FAQs um, in advance before you do submit questions, because a lot of times we've already answered that question. And lastly, I just want to remind you to save the date for the HUD conference on homelessness. Um, in September, there's two sessions, one in Denver and one in Atlanta. They're exactly the same. And we're going to be talking about HPRP, HEARTH, and HMIS. So that concludes our presentation of HPRP Beyond the Basics. Thank you all for your attention and for listening.